grab your souls a seat. It's a privilege this morning to be able to introduce Grant. Don't sit down, Grant. <laughs> he is going to be sharing with us a um, topic that I am passionate about and is on my heart, so I'm really excited that uh, Grant can be with us and share with us this morning. So I'll hand over to you, but let's welcome Grant this morning. Thank you very much, Charlie. It's great to be with you guys. You're a vibey bunch, aren't you? <laughs> this is wonderful. Thanks very much to Paul and the team for leading us to sing worshipfully together so wonderfully well. What was that? All right. I still didn't hear you. Guys team. Well, yeah. All of them together. Good on you, guy. Thanks, man. Uh, let's pray, shall we? Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for this community of, of faith, this, this, this family that is All Saints Build. And, uh, we're not all in this room, but uh, we are a collective of people who love you, God. We want to honour you with all that we are. We want to serve you and worship you in every moment of every day. And God, I pray that you would speak to us this morning. Uh, those of us who are in the room, those of us who are watching online, God, I pray that you would leave us not unchanged. Have your way with us, God. Help us to hear what you're saying to us through the scriptures and hopefully through uh, how I expand on the scriptures this morning. And, and give us the boldness and the courage to respond appropriately to uh, what you are saying to us. Amen. So some of you have detected an Australian accent, I'm sure. Uh, please don't hold that against me. But I'm married a Kiwi and I live in Upper Mutari. And can I introduce you to my Fano? All right, I couldn't bring them with us this morning, but I've got a photograph, I believe. Yeah, there we go. That's my bunch. Pretty good, right? Uh, so Brooke uh, was raised in Upper Mutiri, and I met her 23, 24 years ago, and I fell in love with her so hard that I decided I wanted to ask her to marry me, and she thankfully said yes. But I didn't realise this. If, if you propose to a female Kiwi, and she says yes, and you marry her, eventually you will live in New Zealand. <laughs> I had no idea at the time, but we actually had a long distance courtship and engagement. And as soon as we got married, I, we, we moved to be in America. We lived there for 17 years. So Max, Marcus and Casper are all born in the United States. Uh, they're also Kiwi dual citizens, which is pretty cool. But about five, six years ago, Brooke managed to convince me that we'd be uh, better to be living in New Zealand, closer to where her parents are. So that's why we've been up in Mutri for the last six years. Pretty good, right? Yeah, so they're an awesome bunch. But I am here this morning representing a wonderful organisation called World Vision. Who's heard of World Vision before? Well, it might have been easy to say who hasn't heard of World Vision before. Hey, Jesse, good to see you, man. Yeah. Um, confession, I'm actually not on staff with World Vision, but I love World Vision so much. What they do, how they do it, uh, that whenever I get to sing or speak, I like to invite people to, to get involved with what they do. It's amazing how they make it so easy for people like you and me to connect with children and communities in places around the world like Uganda, where life is really, really tough. And it's actually through a lot of planning that we've got this service this morning, where at the end of this service is an opportunity for you to sponsor a child with World Vision. And some of us in this room, I'm sure, already sponsor with World Vision or, or maybe one of the other amazing organisations that do similar work. Uh, but still, even if you already sponsor a child or a second or a third, you know, there's a chance to sponsor this morning. It might be a 56th this morning. I don't know. I don't know. But there is that opportunity. And I'm hoping that we all open ourselves to what God might be saying to us this morning with regard to children who are living in extreme poverty. It costs $54 a month to sponsor a child with World Vision. Um, and, and you have opportunity to write letters, receive letters and build a relationship and hopefully pray for one another. Uh, who are the people who already sponsor with World Vision or one of the other wonderful organisations like that? Right, you know what this is like. This is good stuff. But please don't block out the opportunity to sponsor this morning. And uh, you know, things are a little bit different, actually, because we're partnering, like we here at All Saints Bur Burwood are going to be partnering with a particular community in Uganda. Um, now, this is a country that's in sort of East Central Africa, borders with Sudan, Congo, Rwanda, Tanzania, and there are about 40 million people living in Uganda, and 40% of them live on less than a, do a US dollar a day, which uh, makes them living in extreme poverty. 
Uh, in particular, it's Alito in northern Uganda. Oh, I went too far forward there. Let me go back a bit. Sorry. The Alito in northern Uganda is the actual community that we'll be partnering with. And I know that All Saints is familiar with northern Uganda because of your partnership um, with One Day Health. Is that right? Nick Lang? Yeah. So this is the amazing thing. This is a really similar region to where Alito is, where Nick is working is very, very close by. In fact, Phil Sapsford over here, who's here with Olivia from World Vision, give people a wave for you guys. They actually are on staff with World Vision. And they, they, uh, Phil and I had a Zoom call with some of the leadership with the World Vision program in Alito uh, and other regions of New Zealand. And they, they know about Nick. And uh, I think, I'm hoping that All Saints is going to be like a glue between uh, One Day Health and World Vision working more in partnership with each other, especially in Alito. Wouldn't that be exciting? Um, but if you don't know much about uh, Uganda, the, the main language, or one of the main languages, is, is Swahili. And uh, so Hakuna Matata comes from Swahili, by the way. But also, um, sometimes people who are living in extreme poverty in Uganda, speaking Swahili, would say these words to each other. They'd say, Yesu and Atosha. Yesu and Atosha. Now that first word, Yesu, sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yesu and Atosha means Jesus is enough. It's a thing that people say to each other when they haven't got enough to eat again. Jesus is enough. And we have a photograph of some of the beautiful children in Alito. Some of these children still waiting for sponsors. Um, and the main challenges for these children in Alito is just quality of education, just not getting enough of the right sort of food, clean drinking water, other basics. But a lot of these kids are living in, in unsafe situations. They're very vulnerable. Uh, there's a, unfortunately a lot of violence in the society. And this is what happens when people are living in extreme poverty. A lot of violence seems to go hand in hand. And unfortunately, uh, especially the girls are at risk of um, very early marriages, being forced into very early marriages. Uh, World Vision are trying to stamp that out. But more about that opportunity in a moment because I want to talk to, uh, talk to you about being chosen. Now when I hear the word chosen, my brain immediately goes to this phrase, the chosen one. Because isn't it true that we are surrounded by stories today, lots of books or movies or TV shows, there's a character who's a chosen one. It's a trope, right? You know that word? Like a, like a hackneyed sort of... Uh, uh, way of having a plot line where the, near the start of our story there's a character who is just one of the ordinary characters, one of, an ordinary person, just one of the many plebs, you know? But then something happens to change all that. You know, they are chosen by fate or by prophecy or some higher power that convinces them that they are not just one of the ordinary characters, they are the chosen one and they have to step into this usually very dangerous adventure to try and what have they got to do? They've got to do something extraordinary. And that's when the adventure starts. Are you familiar with this storyline? All right, I've actually chosen some photographs from Google. If you know some of these, some of my more uh, favoured chosen one characters, just call them out. Who's this guy? Who's that? Who is it? Neo from the Matrix series. Did you know Neo is an anagram for one, O-N-E? Neo, because he's not Mr. Anderson, he's actually the chosen one. And only he can step into the role that he's got. How about this guy? <laughs> Emmett Brikowski from the first uh, Lego movie, actually called The Special. But he's chosen to do something extraordinary. He couldn't do it. Now, this is a little bit dubious, perhaps, but I think Luke Skywalker took us a few movies to find out, but he's actually the last Jedi and the chosen one. And I think the Star Wars producers, they love this trope so much of the chosen one that actually Anakin and Rey are both chosen ones as well. It seems strange. And Moana, chosen by the ocean. What has she got to do to feed you the heart? I don't know what. I've seen that movie in bits. <clears throat> but... Uh, my favourite Chosen One character, though, is this guy. Frodo, right? He's just there in Hobbiton. He just wants to hang out, living in his little house under the green hill with the circle door. Life's ordinary, life's fine, 
But actually Gandalf comes to him and says, no, Frodo, you are the only one who can carry the ring of power to Mordor to destroy it. And like all good chosen one characters, Frodo doesn't want this challenge. He doesn't feel adequate. He doesn't feel prepared. One of my favourite moments is as they're leaving the fellowship's first meeting. It's like, Gandalf, I don't know whether to go left or right. Which way? I don't know how to do this. We're surrounded by these stories, aren't we? Now let's recognise, though, that Jesus is the ultimate chosen one. Isn't he? In fact, Jesus, this was written about Jesus many, many years before Jesus was born. This was written about him. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him and he will bring justice to the nation. Some translations say he will bring justice to all people. Jesus is the ultimate chosen one. And notice this. What is he chosen for? To bring justice to all people. Is there justice for all people today? Not yet. It seems that the work of the ultimate chosen one, Jesus the Christ, is not yet complete. But here's another passage about being chosen. Jesus himself says this in Matthew 22. For many are invited, but few are chosen. Who is Jesus referring to? Well, I believe that's those who have submitted their lives to Jesus as Lord. If we recognise Jesus as the Christ, if you and I recognise that Jesus is the ultimate chosen one, then we must recognise that we are chosen. And we are surrounded by so many tropey stories about chosen ones that we might think we're just like Frodo before Gandalf showed up. That we are just to plot our ways as one of the normal characters through life, living in our greenhouse under the hill with the round door. But no, friends, you and I are chosen for something extraordinary. We are chosen by God. Let's dig a little deeper, shall we? 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 4 says, For we know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you. Can we do something that might be a little bit un-Anglican? I don't know. Maybe maybe it's cool. I saw the sheep-goat game. That was fun. I want you to turn to a person beside you, maybe two or three, and say, He has chosen you. Can you say that? Can you do that? Thank you. Wonderfully responsive. He has chosen you. Now, don't get too unruly. Come on. (laughs) Carolyn, he has chosen you. He's chosen you, Paul. Yeah, he's chosen you. Yeah. We are not just another hobbit. We are not here primarily on earth to just live our lives like we are not chosen. You and I are chosen by God to continue the work of Jesus the Christ to bring justice to all people. That is why we are here on earth. We are not here to sit in a pew on Sunday and then get about the rest of our life during the week. We are chosen for something extraordinary. More specifically, what are we chosen for? Colossians 3.12 gives us a clue. Therefore, as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. I believe that if you are a person who has decided to follow Jesus, if you recognise Jesus as the Christ, you and I, we should be recognised for absolutely otherworldly acts of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness and patience. Not levels of kindness and compassion that we manufacture as humans, but it's actually God operating through us. We can't take credit for this. But people who don't yet know Jesus should see people who are following Jesus and go, how are they so compassionate? How is it that they're so kind and humble? How is it that they're so gentle and patient? And this was the case in the early church. But it's not the case in 2024, I'm sorry to tell you. 
You know, I believe that you and I are here on this earth to continue the work of Jesus the Christ as his hands and feet to bring justice to all people. But there is a stinking evil lie that blankets all of creation. A false narrative that is at work, that is at play, and I think it comes from the evil one. Not Mordor. It's this. Those with less are less. This is the stinking lie that's perpetuated by our culture. Our hyper-consumerism. Can you remember this from school days? Maybe I'm weird, but in Australian schools, you used to say things like, beggars can't be choosers. Meaning, if you're doing things tough, you need to be happy with whatever I give you. And that perpetuates us today. I think I'm in a room full of people who are compassionate, who carry the Spirit of God within you. And you know this. This is not new information, right? And you are probably, possibly, very generous. But isn't it true that somewhere in the back of our mind, somewhere hidden in the stony cold part of our heart, there's still this, but I need to take care of myself first. And I'll look after you with what I can. And I'll decide how much. But you and I, we need to be people who recognise that God knows our needs better than we know our needs. So the main problem with the world today is not poverty, it's not starvation, it's not disease or global warming, it's that I am selfish. I know I'm chosen by God by by something extraordinary, but I'm still making sure that I'm well fed, I'm well clothed, I'm popular, I'm fashionable, I'm contactable, I'm transportable. First, and you know, I'll care for the poor, but really with what's left. Beggars can't be choosing. This is a lie that those with less are less. We need to break the back of that lie. As God empowers us, church, our role is to bring justice to all people, to break the back of the lie that those with less are less. Because as we dig more deeply into the scriptures, we'll find that those with less in the eyes of the world are actually more to God. They are more. And this is something that my eyes have been slowly opening to over the last 15 years or so. And there's more to go. I showed you a photograph of my whanau, my family. This is Max, but as a five-year-old. And, you know, when I first became a parent, I was struggling. Uh, you know, I'd been raised in quite an authoritarian sort of family. Uh, my, my dad was Air Force, and so if you did ba- bad behaviour, you knew about it, you know, because there was punishment coming. Um, and I was trying to sort of raise Max that same way. That's the only model I knew, you know. That's all I knew. But Brooke, amazing wise intelligent, well-read woman that she is, she said, I I don't think we should be raising Max that way. And I said, well, what else is there? And she said, well, we've got to give Max choices. Like, when he is about to do a behaviour that's wrong, you say, Max, you need to stop that, but give him a choice. Here's an example of what I mean. If Max is about to draw on the wall of our home, I could say, Max, you mustn't draw on the wall, but you can draw on this piece of paper or on this chalkboard. Are you with me? And he feels loved by that. He feels honoured by that. He feels respected by that. And he makes a better choice. He would actually be happy to not write on the wall. Oh, great, I prefer the the paper. And we, in so doing, as parents, we guide his choices. Free piece of parenting advice. There you go. Give kids choices. Because ultimately, that's what we want, isn't it? We want to raise children to be adults who make the right choice. Because if you just... Fear, punishment, you will never have a big enough police force. Right? We want people to make good choices. All kids need, need to make choices and have that, that loving respect that shows that they can make appropriate age choices. In fact, it was when Max was about that age that he asked Brooke for a cup of milk and a spoon to drink it with. 
And Brooke said, uh, you can have the cup of milk, but I'll give you this straw, or you can drink it straight from the cup. And Max, five-year-old Max, said these words. Can I please have my choices again, but this time a spoon is one of them? <laughs> we want children to have choices, good choices. But you know what happens as we get older? We adults, we end up with too many choices, don't we? Do you know how hard it is for my family to choose one stinking movie to watch together? <laughs> Too many choices. John, you know about this? 100%. Too many choices. You know, I, just to be honest, I'm the sort of person who can look at my wardrobe and think there's nothing to wear. You know, I can open the refrigerator, all this different food there and go, oh, there's nothing to eat. I can be flicking through Netflix and, and also Apple and think there's nothing to watch. You know, you and I have so many choices of how we want to live our lives. And I'm going to suggest to you, it's this overabundance of choices that actually blots out God's voice that says you are chosen for something extraordinary. You are chosen to play your part in breaking the back of the lie that those with less are less. This is the work that Jesus began to bring justice to all nations, to all people. And you, church, are my hands and feet to continue that. But we don't hear that very clearly. I think one of the reasons is because we have too many choices. Perhaps the best definition I've heard for when people are living in poverty is when they have too few choices. I don't think the children in Alito, Uganda are choosing between five breakfast cereals or toast like my kids do most mornings. And the best definition I've heard for when a, when a society is overabundant, when they've got too much, too many choices. Spending most of our waking hours thinking about what we're going to choose from. And that's why we're partnered with World Vision this morning. The needs are greater globally than perhaps they've been in quite a few few years. You know, I've been advocating for the work of children in extreme poverty for a lot of years now. And you know, the, one of the most encouraging... I'm not a sort of guy who wants to tell you statistics you know, about how many children perished. But can I just quickly share this with you? That number, the astronomical number, has been coming down and down and down and down and down. And I realise something exciting. I'm going to be the generation that, that sees the end of extreme poverty. I'm excited about this. But actually with COVID and global warming and the global food crisis, the number for the first time in 40 years, am I right, Phil, has gone up. The needs are great. There's more work to do. And so I want to tell you about a, a guy named Charles, Charles Cabena. He lives in Malawi. A little village in Sanzani when he was growing up. They were living in extreme poverty. Now, Charles and his family lived on a little subsistence farm. That means whatever they got to eat, they had to grow it first. Although sometimes Charles was sent out into the bush to try and find roots and berries and things that could po they could possibly eat. And there was often not enough food. The crops would sometimes fail because of too much or too little rain. No choices. Often not enough food. There was water around most of the time, but often this water, if people drank it, would make them sick. If people did get sick or injured, there was no chance of get a pro getting proper medical attention. Now, even though Charles and his family had faith in God, it was very hard for them to understand that God really loved them and really had a purpose for them because there were so few choices for them. Charles at that time in his life could only see two choices. Either I stay on the farm and probably starve or I become a criminal one day. But something changed when Charles was only seven years old. He noticed around the village that there were some orange colours. And then there were these people who were representing this organisation called World Vision. And they were meeting with, with uh, pastors of churches and other community leaders and coming up with a plan to make changes for the better, to give people a few more choices. And Charles noticed that now there was enough food to eat. Now the water was clean and didn't make people sick. If people did, did get sick, they'd get the medical attention they need. And before World Vision showed up, school for Charles was 250 hungry children with aching tummies 
trying to listen to one undertrained teacher sitting under a mango tree. Not much learning happening. But now there were more trained teachers. Now there were school buildings being built, even a toilet block. And Charles tells me about this amazing experience of using the first flushing toilet of his life. <clears throat> and then at age nine, Charles heard about a man named Frank in the United States who had chosen Charles to be his sponsored child. And Frank was a hero to Charles. Now, Charles is an extraordinary young man. I'm telling you a story from quite a few years ago. He's an adult now. He's a Facebook friend of mine. I've spoken to him on Zoom calls. And uh, Charles with an extraordinary intellect that would have never been discovered. His choices started opening up. And because of his abilities, World Vision were able to support him all the way through high school and then even into university. He studied journalism, started making a little bit of money writing articles on the side even while he was studying. And he started supporting children back in Senzani out of his meagre income. And that grew into supporting more children in partnership with other people in his situation. Um, and then Charles, out of university, actually took a job with World Vision. And I've taken a couple of photos from his Facebook page. Check these out. This is Charles Cabana. He's a man who, honestly, I wish he was here rather than me speaking to you this morning. But he is a man who, obviously, he hangs, he holds himself with this poise and this grace that is only possible, I think, from a person who knows they're chosen by God for an extraordinary role in life to break the back of the lie that those with less are less. Now Charles actually finished his job with World Vision about a year and a half ago and he actually is now studying political science uh, but he's also doing other work. Uh, this is a more recent photograph of Charles. Things have changed for him, haven't they? He is now one of the directors of DreamShare Foundation which uh, last time I spoke to him was, was supporting 283 children across 37 different schools in Malawi. And he's also taken a job that has him help uh, NGOs present their message better. Uh, that's the talk about media. You might be looking at the next UN representative of Malawi or perhaps the next president. But you know the hero of this story? is Frank. Remember Frank? Frank signed up to sponsor Charles. You know, there are over 1,200 Bible verses about the poor. I want to share a couple with you. Has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of the world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him. See, the poor are not less. The poor are more. The materially poor, those who appear to us on this earth as poor, are actually spiritually rich. And we need them more than they need us in an eternal sense. You know, Jesus begins his earthly ministry when he walked into a temple and he opened a scroll, Jesus, our ultimate chosen one, read a prophecy about him. And he reads from Luke 4, we find it recorded in Luke 4, 18, where he reads, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. And he continues as we actually unpacked in one of our songs earlier. But he starts with, I've come to give good news to the poor. And he finishes his earthly ministry with the Bible passage about the sheep and the goats. This is like bookends to me. Yes, he's born and he lives, but he starts his earthly ministry here and he ends it with this sermon before he's betrayed and crucified and rises from the dead. And it's the story of the sheep and the goats. And I'm not going to read the whole passage to you, but here's my synopsis. Jesus tells us very clearly that one day each of us, it's like one of my kids would do that, Back in the day. Stay with me here, please. Thanks. I know that's more entertaining, but stay here. 
Jesus tells us very clearly through this story of the sheep and the goats. I nearly grabbed him myself. Gotcha. 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 Not my first radio. Jesus tells us very clearly in Matthew 25 that one day, Judgment Day, something we find it tough to talk about, isn't it? One day, Judgment Day, everybody's going to stand before Jesus. And he's going to separate us into one of two groups, like a shepherd separates sheep from goats. And he's better at spotting the difference than we are. Right? As I understand it, the sheep are those who will spend eternity with God. I don't really understand all that, but it seems to me that they're the people who knew they were chosen. They're God's chosen ones. And the goats, unfortunately, are not. But do we know the one outward sign that Jesus describes that would indicate whether Grant Norsworthy or any of us are sheep and not goats? It's not which direction our tail goes. Do we know what it is? I know some of us do. But can I say this to you? If you don't know what this is, you need to know what this is. Now understand, being a sheep or or salvation or, or spending eternity with God is a completely free gift. No obligation. It doesn't require your performance. However, and paradoxically, the one outward sign that indicates that I am chosen and that I'll be with God forever is how I treat the least of these. The hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the lonely, the imprisoned. In fact, Jesus goes even further. He doesn't say, uh, the way you treat those people, that's as if you were doing that for me. He says, that is you doing it for me. So in a mysterious Matthew 25 sense, Jesus is the hungry, the thirsty, the naked, the sick, the lonely, and the imprisoned. They are not less, they are more. Because Jesus says this, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. And he continues, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for one of the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. And so I need to give you this this challenge. I want to give you this challenge. If you know that you are chosen, it'll never get easier than right now to step more fully into what that could mean for you through this partnership with World Vision. I'd like each of us to sponsor a child. You might already sponsor one or two or five, but open yourself to what God might be saying to you right now. But when I began sponsoring the year 2000, there was a table in the foyer of a church that is just like this and I was sitting where you are and someone else was asking me to go and choose which child I wanted to sponsor and I did it and I'm glad I did but can I confess something to you? I chose the, the kid who would look good on my fridge because I wanted a bit of evidence that I was one of the good guys. Look at me, I'm already doing my bit. Don't ask me to give again. I, I bought myself a little bit of religious self-righteousness. I turned Carabo and Rwanda into another commodity for me. But then I met Carabo in 2009. And in the nation of Rwanda, I met more Jesus in the rubble, in the villages where there's nothing. I met more Jesus in Rwanda than I'd ever met in Australia or the United States or New Zealand. And those of you who have been to what we might call the field, you know exactly what I'm talking about, don't you? So we have this opportunity through partnership with World Vision. But there's no table out there with photographs for for us to choose. We've got too many choices, haven't we? We've realised that it's this overabundance of choices that's blocking us. So I want us to, you know, let's do something we've never done before. I've got a short movie from my friends at World Vision I want to share with you. Here it is.
So I'm going to ask you to do three things. One, I want you to sincerely, prayerfully, thoughtfully ask God, what should I do with regard to the children in Alito, Uganda this morning? Should I sponsor? He knows our needs better than we do. Two, listen for his answer. Three, 